Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to reassure you that this is a real panel. This is not a hoax. We're delighted to have Mike Bonanno of uh, Yes Men with us for about an hour. Also, Pfizer Ollison of Greenpeace. Her face may also be familiar to you because, of course, uh, Pfizer was one of the Arctic 30, uh, the Greenpeace activists who, back in 2013, were arrested and detained in Russia for their protest at the Gazprom oil rig. So her face, unfortunately, was all over the world back in 2013. And it's my pleasure also to introduce Jorge Vinuales, a Professor of Environment Law from Cambridge University. <laughs> my name is Claire Duhl, and I've been given the task of trying to keep to some very Swiss timekeeping. Um, we are ending, I'm told, at 11.07 so the lights will go out then. We have um, a discussion between the three panelists for about 40, 45 minutes. Please, if you have questions, do hold them because then the floor will be yours. And of course, you can ask your questions in English or French, whatever you feel more comfortable in. Um, we're gonna hear from our speakers about their assessment of civil society. Is civil society at the heart of the action? What tactics work? Where are the challenges? And of course, the thoughts about the Paris Climate Change Conference happening at the end of the year. So perhaps if I might uh, turn to uh, Pfizer and just ask you for your sense of civil society. Um, what's morale like? We, we saw in the film the Arab Spring, we saw the Occupy movement, times of great hope. What's your assessment of morale today? Uh, thanks, Claire, for the um, question. Um, it's, a, it's a big question. I mean, civil society, try to grab that in, 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 in one sentence. And about the morale of civil society, I mean, there are a lot of, me as an environmental activist, there are a lot of moments to be cynical, as you also saw with, with the Yes Men in the, in the documentary. Um, but every time if I look at history, but also what's happening nowadays, that when people take action massively in big numbers, change is still possible. And I think for me, if I look back at what, what was in the most inspirational thing in the past 10 years that happened, is without a doubt the Arab Spring, which for me was inconceivable 10 years ago. Even though some people are now calling it the Arab winter? Um, well, <laughs> I think with any form of where you have big disruptive movements, uh, where change is happening. I mean, look at what happened in the 60s. Um, you know, the movement uh, uh, under the leadership of Martin Luther King. That didn't go smoothly without any victims. Same thing for Gandhi and what happened in India. Um, I mean, it wasn't just a matter of let's go do a protest in one day. You know, try to hold on for a few months and then boom, we have saved the, we have changed the world. Of course not. And it's heartbreaking to see what's happening in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, but I still get goosebumps by the fact that in Tunis, Libya, Egypt, and so on, millions of people have been able to get rid of their dictators. Yeah. Uh, Mike, we saw a few moments there when you and uh, Andy were scratching your heads thinking, oh my goodness, this uh, direct action, this uh, militantism, activism, does it uh, work? Do you, do you have moments of uh, self-doubt? Uh, yeah, always. <laughs> <laughs> no, it always seems like it's not working. This is, you know, until it works. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, even the victories seem like they don't work. You know, even when they're obvious victories, like in the case of the 
Chamber of Commerce action here. You know, we were uh, doing something with a large movement of people who were putting pressure on the Chamber of Commerce. Um, it, there were lots of organizations and individuals that are all participating in that campaign. And then we kind of piled on at the right time to um, suddenly have the Chamber change their position on that one issue. But at the same time, you know, even though two weeks later the Chamber says they're no longer going to undermine the climate legislation in Congress, then as activists who have been, had been pushing for that, then we had to basically say, oh, fuck, that, that um, bill in Congress is, is, is shit. You know, <laughs> it, it can't possibly be good if the Chamber of Commerce is not fighting it anymore. And so, and sure enough, you know, they were able to water it down enough. So that feels like a defeat, even though there's a small victory. But I think that the point is that in the long range, these struggles, as Faisal was saying, they, they, they do succeed. You know, and all of the th things that we take for granted now, like eight hour work days, you know, had long struggles behind them, women's right to vote, long struggles behind them, and struggles in which, you know, a lot of people um, got arrested, a lot of people went to jail for long periods of time, and in which it, it eventually took massive numbers of people to win. So the tactic of humor, you believe that that is effective? Um, how effective? Well, it's uh, funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, humor is, is one tactic, and I don't know, <clears throat> I can't, I don't have a, a, an applause meter to measure its effectiveness. You know, we can measure how loud people laugh, but we can't really measure whether that works for political change. I mean, there are actually scientific ways of doing that, like social scientists will tell you, and pol polling people, and that's the way the advertising industry works, but we've never had that kind of budget to actually figure out <laughs> if we're successful and if humor is working. You know, you need millions of dollars, literally, to like conduct the kind of um, research that we would need to definitively answer that question on any given issue at any given moment uh, within specific demographics. So the answer is, I don't know, but all these tactics together do work, and what we've seen if, again, if you look at every movement, you see humor as a part of it. And, you know, some movements more than others, but uh, if a lot of successful revolutions, you talk to people who participate and they say, oh yeah, there was so much funny shit going on. We were like laughing our asses off every night and, you know, and we never had a, a better time in our lives. And I think that's a part of it is that there is a collective euphoria and humor is a part of that, love and laughing and, uh, you know, feeling like you're part of something is, is so important. And I think, it, um, I think it appeals to groups of people that might not take action or, or get engaged if, if, they're, if they're basically just overthrown with very depressing images all the time. Um, I have, I know people in, in my, um, in my environment <laughs> that, you know, when they see, for example, something on the internet or on the, on the news that's quite depressing, whether it's Tarzans or pollution, massive oil pollution in Nigeria, they just prefer to turn away from it and not think about it and just continue, you know, just enjoying life. But if you can take something very seriously and turn it into something funny, and I think one very inspiring example is the ice bucket challenge that if, is, does anybody, everybody know what the ice bucket challenge is? It's about this very serious, depressing disease called ALS. And the organization behind it was able to take something that terrible and make it funny and light and that people all over the world wanted to be part of it and do something about it. Funny and light, often environmentalists are seen as being very dogmatic. Um, Yohoki, you're uh, nodding along with me there. Yes, a little bit. Um, I, I think that humor, it's much more difficult to neutralize with cynical uh, reaction. So you maybe, you know, sort of develop a sort of cynical reaction, which is very good to recycle a, a message that is true. So you can recycle a message that is true by saying, well, this is too serious, this is the same boring stuff that we hear all over the place. We already know that, okay, give me a break. But when you bring it through humor, it, it, you're touching a different acupuncture point. And I think it's, it, is, it is quite powerful. Uh, I, frankly, 
I think it's very different than the usual sort of sermonizing um, uh, type of discourse that you have in, in environmental circles. Because mm. Pfizer, I mean, even stunts and activities, some people think, oh my goodness, there they go again. They're using tactics of uh, the previous decade or that they're old fashioned. I mean, is that a question that ever Greenpeace asks itself? Oh, definitely, especially when it comes to one of the tactics Greenpeace, for example, has been using since the start. In fact, that's it's exactly how Greenpeace um, began, is using ships. Using ships to sail to all places, remote areas in the world, um, to bear witness to any, any wrongdoings, uh, specifically <coughs> environmental wrongdoings. And we still do that. Forty years later, we'll still do that. And... Um, I get to hear often, like, isn't that in an old-fashioned way? Isn't the new way to take action is just to get have people sign petitions and so on? Um, I think, yeah, true. I think definitely with technology nowadays, there are new ways to take action and to make a difference. Um, but I think the good thing about using something old-fashioned like, you know, ships and taking action is going to places where it actually happens, where you cannot bring thousands or millions of people with you. Um, for example, where I took action with 29 others in the, um, in the Russian Arctic um, to bear witness to what's happening there. Um, the first platform active in producing actually the first drops of Arctic oil. Um, and that did definitely increase the awareness of what's happening in the Arctic. You talk about new technology. Um, we saw at the end of the film you were grappling with the website. Um, I mean, do you see that that um, using technology to really g get to a new younger generation is the way forward? Uh, not really. I think the way forward is uh, <laughs> uh, just any technology. Um, and it's funny, like one of the things that <clears throat> we've noticed, you know, there's all this <clears throat> bullshit about you know Facebook revolutions and stuff like that. And Facebook, it's a tool, it's a communication tool that works for notifying people about things that are happening. But um, you know, in talking to people who used to organize massive protests when all they had was telephones, there were incredibly effective, I would argue, more effective ways of mobilizing people fast. Uh, the phone tree, where one person calls ten people. And then those 10 people call 10 more people. And pretty soon, in 10 steps, you've got a million people. And that can happen in 10 minutes. And you don't just have a notice going up on Facebook. You have a, a kind of contract between people who are part of a chain, who see themselves as an as a important link in that chain. So I think that those methods can be even, you know, it's how you use the methods. And, and so I don't know. It's, um, But yeah, it's an important tool. And, you know, I think just to wrap back around to Greenpeace, it's Greenpeace is trying a lot of things, all kinds of things. You know, it's not just banner hangs and ships. Uh, I mean, the reason that <clears throat> the reason we were working with Greenpeace was because they were willing to try all kinds, like whatever works. You know, all tactics. <laughs> Even if it includes sometimes not sailing a ship, uh, sailing a ship to the Arctic and trying to do something in a funny way. Um, but to come back on, because you were talking about the Facebook revolution, and um, uh, if you look at the Arab, sp I think that's what you meant, right? It's often linked to the Arab Spring, that because it happened because we have social media. But I fully agree, I think it's, it's a tool, and I think it, it's another way to, for people to get together. And I believe that research has also shown, especially if you look at Tunis, Libya, and Egypt, in all countries where you had the, uh, that are part of the Arab Spring, is that those networks started years ago. And the, the bases started years ago in people getting together, forming groups, and figuring out how to actually make a change. And Facebook, Facebook did play a role in that, but was not the essential factor in bringing about what happened. I just have to pick up on something which I'm sure is in the audience's mind too. We did learn that you got arrested in Switzerland. <laughs> Would you care to tell us more about that? Oh, that's a little bit embarrassing. Um, <laughs> <coughs> it's actually... Uh, it Your mum embarrassed yeah, you no, at the dinner uh, table. 
Yeah, it was about a decade ago. It was, in fact, almost exactly a decade ago uh, in Davos. Um, we were here with our first movie, and our Swiss distributor uh, decided brilliantly to bring us out and first take us on a tour of the WTO, at which we, we met our kind of, you know, uh, our Nemesis. enemy. Yeah, it was very <laughs> funny. It was a very weird meeting. Um, <laughs> The, uh, meeting the PR guy who we'd been sort of battling for years. It's very strange. And, the, uh, and then we went to Davos, and uh, the, the WEF was in session, and me and Andy were playing around with the video camera, and there were fences everywhere. I mean, at the time, Davos was kind of, had been in previous years under siege by activists, mm -hmm. and um, this year it was a little bit calmer, two, I think it was 2005, but there were still fences everywhere, and we had no idea where the actual compound was, where they were meeting, because there were so many fences and so many checkpoints and so many um, funny military guys with sleds and machine guns, and so, um, which seemed so comic for us. It was like playtime at the same t I mean, <laughs> at the same time as gun time. Um, anyway. We, uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we went underneath one of the fences and then the military guys came out in their little sleds from every corner and, and they actually tackled Andy and then we ended up in jail. So, but, but the, the distributor actually got us out just in time for the question and answer session that night. So we were only in for the day. <laughs> right. Well, thank goodness for that. Of course, Pfizer was uh, arrested and detained for more than uh, three months in Russia. And I suppose that prompts the question about, uh, you know, is it justified to break the law? Maybe that's a question for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> this is Switzerland. People are very law-abiding. Um, it might depend on what law you're breaking uh -huh. in, in your kind of activism and what you can determine to be your activism. Or what the authorities make of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, you know, and, and sometimes it, it helps to be arrested, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, in terms of helping the, the movement or, you know, you, you, you sometimes it's strategic, it's about gumming up the system or getting enough people arrested, but, you know, uh, I think everybody that we remember that's part of struggles, almost everybody was arrested lots of times, I mean, whether it's, you know, the suffragettes or... Uh, well, I guess Nelson Mandela, recently I was talking to a guy called Douglas Monzora, who's been arrested about 33 times, who is um, in Zimbabwe writing the, the, the uh, new constitution, and Mugabe's had him thrown in jail over and over again. Um, and I said, wow, God, 33 times, you've been arrested so much. And he's like, well, it's really nothing, you know, because we, we think in terms of Mandela going away for 30 years. so." You know, 33 times, and I've been in jail for maybe half a year or a year total. It's nothing. <laughs> I said, okay, right. But it, this is the thing, is they were doing something illegal, you know? Uh, <laughs> you were just going under a fence at Davos. Yeah. No, no, I, no, I totally <laughs> accept that. But I'm just wondering if we could bring in Jorge, as you are a professor of environmental <laughs> law. Yeah, what's okay? Well... <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, well, I think that there are many, many, you know, levels at which you can answer that. Uh, the, the very, very basic thing is that, of course, there are causes that are legitimate, although they are illegal. Now, opening that Pandora box is quite dangerous sometimes, but even within the, those things that are sort of legitimate but illegal, you can draw some sort of lines between things that are still nonviolent, uh, that I think that are, you know, much more acceptable than things that are violent, uh, violent within civil disobedience. Now, even when you have a situation where things are nonviolent and, 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 and at the same time illegal but nonviolent and legitimate and so on, you can still tweak a little bit the law. And, and we saw at the very end of this movie, and I think it's, it's a very interesting point uh, strategically, that one of the reasons why probably this claim was, was dropped is that because it was potentially exposing information that was much more valuable for the company that brought the suit than the sort of uh, threat that they were tackling. Uh, and, and that type of sort of exposure of information is a very vulnerable point, it's a very powerful acupuncture point, which makes uh, environmental activism uh, 
if well targeted, pretty powerful. It's just about touching the, the right acupuncture point. And you saw that, of course, you can tweak more the laws to make it, to make it in a way safer. What you would be doing would still be illegal, nonviolent, and legitimate, and you would be a little bit less exposed to that kind of threats that after all can cost a lot of money and can actually ruin your, your everyday life for years and years. Because there was the Aarhus Convention, wasn't there, about uh, oh, actually yeah. getting information. And are you seeing that yeah. that is a trend, that uh, increasingly that's the way to, there are, to change? There are, many, yeah, there are many, many instruments that can be used. I mean, I, I, I always have this impression that uh, the instruments that are out there, the legal instruments, I mean, you have plenty of instruments as, as well, but many legal instruments that are out there are being underused, underused. And uh, th there is a lot of creativity sometimes in, in sort of, I wouldn't say, the word hijacking is bad because it would give you the wrong impression that you can hijack um, uh, for a negative cause uh, a mechanism. But you can use, you can test to the full some legal mechanisms that are out there and have not been used yet for these causes. But is it a matter, is it, is it, do you really think it's a matter of being unused or maybe it n doesn't necessarily get the attention as, for example, a funny action like the Yes Men would do or something that, for example, confrontational Greenpeace does? Because, Claire, your first question was, um, you know, what, are, what tactics bring about change mm. and action is only one tactic. I mean, people th sometimes think like, oh, What's the next action you're going to do, Faiza? 90% of the time, I'm just behind my desk. I'm writing lobby letters. I'm talking to journalists. I'm talking to the government, to companies. And every once in a while, when we believe it's necessary to catalyze or to change something, we c do action. But legal uh, proceedings are a part of it. Y you're entirely right. And as a matter of fact, th this is about com complementing things. Uh, I, I frankly don't think that... <laughs> I don't know, bringing a, a, a petition between before a, a, a UN agency will attract as much attention as you can uh, attract through direct action. But uh, that's a, a controversial thing to say in Geneva, the the city of consensus and well, conventions. I'm an academic. I'm free to. I mean, have <laughs> free speech. So I mean, if I was working for a UN agency or a company or something else, I'd probably be du be using plenty of buzzwords. I, I just don't do that. Sorry. Also, um, uh, we're uh, over years. We're sort of learning uh, a little bit more about how we might coordinate on some of these issues. So, for instance, uh, here we 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 now have the support of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who represents us, the uh, you know a nonprofit legal support group, and and so whenever we have a a, a threat, a lawsuit uh, threatened, you know, we we get legal letters all the time letters that say people are going to sue us, it doesn't mean they're going to. But when we get a letter, then we go to them and they say, well, we'd like to, we'd like, we like this case, yes, push back, or, well, this is not going to be useful for changing the law. And in fact, it might be, you know, bad. <laughs> so so we, we're working smarter, I think, than we were, mostly because there are lawyers there, there who are recognizing the value of that publicity stunt or that moment and then the value of, of, of where it might move the law if they're lucky enough to take it to court. So, Just uh, coming back to you, Jorge, about uh, this I idea of uh, you know working within the system. Um, NGOs here in Geneva, they have consultative status at the United Nations. I mean, uh, isn't that... Um, an effective way of really getting change by working within the system? Well, I, I think that it's, it's a very important part of the work. I, I think that you cannot say that um, that only things that happen without the system or outside of the system are, are the effective ones. Uh, again, it, it depends on what type of target you're trying to reach. I mean, if you, if you, if you have different uh, different targets, I mean, if you really are trying to, to attract attention on some issue uh, and and you are behaving far too much uh, in accordance with the rules, uh, you may uh, be under below the radar, in a way. Uh, that's a little bit what's happening, but it would be 
really inaccurate, and I think it would be it's important not to, uh, you know, get the wrong idea on that point. It would be really inaccurate to state that the NGO that it work and even the UN work that is being conducted uh, according to the rules is not useful or important. It may be slow, it may be slow, but there are reasons why it is slow. Some are very bad reasons, some are good. You'd mentioned to me that uh, you saw that some of these uh, consultations at UN level by civil society were what you called a pro forma straitjacket. Well, that, that's a problem when you, when you actually, uh, when action becomes too mainstreamed. Um, you can be, in a way, captured. Your action can be captured. And that's what's happening, in a way. A system that is pushed to uh, incorporate views may prefer to incorporate views in accordance to, uh, uh, with their own rules. And those rules may sort of play as a police uh, as a sort of uh, governing systems to keep, like a thermostat, to keep the pressure put by the civil society within limits that are completely manageable by the system. And that's what I call sometimes not just performer uh, participation, uh, but other types of participation that are, are more meaningful, and yet uh, they don't uh, issue uh, a strong dividend in terms of moving the agenda forward. Pfizer, um, of course, green issues to a certain extent have gone mainstream politically. Corporations which have signed up to the UN Global Compact, uh, there's the World Sustainable Business Council uh, here in, in Geneva. I mean, do you sometimes think, you know, w what am I fighting against now? I wish that was the case. Unfortunately, that um, a lot of these initiative, initiatives, I mean, they, it is, I think, um, in a way, a win of the environmental movement uh, in, in the sense of agenda setting and, uh, and raising awareness, but a lot of these coalitions and, and you know, every, every, like, slap eco on it and you're doing something good, um, <coughs> You're doing something good if you're preventing the mass extinction that our planet is going towards because of deforestation and overfishing and climate change. And it's doing something good if it's actually preventing the um, global warming and keeping it within two degrees Celsius. But it's not the case. Most of the initiatives are not the case. And that can be, um, that can be backed up with research, that it's not enough. If we um, look forward now to the uh, UN Climate Change Conference in Paris, uh, what do you think it's going to take for that to be deemed a success and not a failure, like we saw in the film of the uh, Copenhagen Climate Change Conference? Yeah, that's... <laughs> what would you like to see? What would I like to see? Um... <coughs> That they actually, that we actually get what has been announced for several years now, especially in the past few months. I mean, Ban Ki-moon said it, there needs to be a strong binding international uh, climate agreement. Um, and something a bit more specific than just saying, yeah, by 2050, we need to be, uh, f you know, have a full in 200% renewables, which is great. But every government, at least most governments already have been saying that for years, but unless you have a very specific plan how you're gonna get there, and also in the sense of climate justice, how are you gonna help relatively poor countries that not necessarily are the major contributor to climate change, but are most impacted, um, I, don't, I don't think it would be very meaningful. And I am hopeful in the sense that, especially when you look at the U.S.-China deal and also the progress th uh, some countries within Europe are making, that does give me a lot of hope. But I'm still very skeptical. Is there going to be? Is it going to be a massive disappointment like Copenhagen in 2009, or are we going to get something more? And what I think is an op important as an environmental activist that. Paris is going to be another moment. Hopefully, you know, this milestone we accomplish in the struggle in limiting climate change, but it's not going to be the end. I think it's n too naive, and that goes for every action. It's too naive to think that that one moment in time is going to change everything. It's a part of it. So the battle will continue after 
December 2015. Jorge, how hopeful are you about uh, the Paris Climate Change Conference? Uh, again, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, what, what realistically, what you, I mean, the best ever result that you one could get, I mean, what people are actually dreaming of that will never probably happen, is that you have a treaty, binding treaty, with uh, quantified emission reduction commitments, not just for countries of the Annex One, the developed countries, but also for countries that are emerging economies, India, China, Brazil, and so on. Uh, that is probably not going to happen in that way. Uh, so we can be pretty sure that uh, uh, what is going to happen is, is going to be below what the expectations are, and yet it's going to be a very important step. And we hear a lot about Copenhagen as a disaster. It was a technically a disaster, but plenty of the people that are probably in this audience and many other people that are out there had not heard in that much detail about climate change before 2007 to 2009. The run up to Copenhagen, I mean, despite the climate <coughs> conference itself, the process that takes to Copenhagen and beyond uh, is, is very useful to build in terms of participation, to build like a, a sense of awareness in people. So I, I, I'm looking at that as much as I'm looking at the formal process. That, that's true, but maybe, maybe this what, what makes climate change in, in the sense of, of a battle um, for, for social justice different than other battles I've seen is that the thing is even though you have these small wins, um, we're not really winning the we're not really winning the war because we're just simply running out of time. We're really running out of time. And definitely Copenhagen was important in that awareness and, and getting it higher on the on the agenda. But I am well, I'm twenty seven. I don't know for some people but if I'm gonna if I'm not gonna be hit by a car soon, or die from an awful disease, or um, something else. I'm gonna be living in 2050, and I'm frightened how that world is, how the world is then gonna look like. And that's the thing. I mean, people always say to me like, "Yeah, yeah, but we have made a small change," and I'm, and that's what I'm fighting for. But the problem is, if there's not gonna be something concrete by the end of 2015, we are seriously heading into a massive, massive problem. Hopefully we will be there too at 2050. I mean, all, all of us. Well, but that's <laughs> the frustrating thing some people say to me. And they, like, you know, when I go to the room and you have this, this, you know, former politician speaking who is over 60 or over 70, and like looking to a bunch of young people, and then saying like, you are the future. You are going to be the one making a change. And I think like, yes, after your generation screwed screwed it up. And then you're gonna put, you know, you know, basically lay it down to the younger generation. Then saying like, we're not gonna do anything, despite the fact that we, with our short-term interest, are still the one contributing to screwing up the planet. We're not gonna do anything. Um, I think Claire, when we spoke before, you were saying to me like, you know, what can the younger generation do? My question would be, I think anything you can do would make a difference. But what about those wealthy, healthy, older people who have billions of invested in fossil fuels who are reaping up, you know, who are benefiting of it and now saying to us, kids, you're gonna make the difference. If there are any people, older people, wealthy, healthy, older people in this room that, you know, think they're one of them, please, you can actually in the coming 10 to 20 years still make that massive difference. <laughs> well, um, Mike, I think, uh, before I open questions up to the public, whether they are the uh, young public or the uh, healthy and the wealthy of Geneva, uh, you just have to tell us, uh, there's just uh, four of us on this uh, panel, what have you got up your sleeve then for the Paris Climate Change Conference? Oh, nothing, um, nothing at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, I, I, I don't know, I have no idea. But um, I, I think a success for me in Paris would be, you know, seeing, um, millions, maybe tens of millions, let's try that, tens of millions of people out on the streets in Paris. I mean, it's in the middle of Europe, right? This is a pretty populated place. People can get on trains and get there. Um, and everybody in this room should, should go. I mean, it's gonna be a giant street party. Uh, <laughs> and, but, but wait, but in between now and then, because th there we'll be there to show our support for negotiations that come up with hard you know, results, 
But in between now and then, I, I want to see, I, I, every day I want to read about somebody disrupting something that's fucking shit up. Because that's the other part of this, is that we do need to disrupt as much as possible uh, the status quo. Because uh, right now, I mean, there's all kinds of things. Even, even, I'm sorry, but even charity events need to be disrupted, right? Because I mean, we went and disrupted a charity event recently. And people said, why did you do that? Why did you take over the microphone of, uh, uh, of all things, of a thing called Cinema for Peace? Why would you do that, <laughs> right? But we're there with Gitz. We're in Berlin for, you know, and he's, he's coming from a place where literally where he used to live is a giant smoking hole in the ground. And, and he's saying, well, all these rich people in this room are having a charity dinner where they're, they're you know, paying money and they're, they're like buying indulgences for what's happening. Meanwhile, the money they're using for charity is, is coming from fossil fuels because they're invested in fossil fuels. It's like 30% of the market is fossil fuels. So the disruption was to say, charity isn't enough, divest. But it was something, the, the, you know, divest, get your money out of fossil fuels. And so this is, but, but you know, I, I think even disruption as stupid as that, because it was stupid, disrupting a charity dinner, but, <laughs> you know, grabbing the microphone from Natalie Portman, that's what we did, you know. <laughs> It was really dumb, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it still it still felt okay to me in the end because I thought okay, we should be doing this at every oil conference. We should be at every event. We need to be up there grabbing the microphone and s trying to stop it, trying to s stop it. And you know the thing is like this is not just for for y the youth, right? Like the older you get, kind of the better you can be at disrupting things. Because people, you can use that tactically. Like people don't know what to do. If so, if you dress up in a nice looking suit and get up and start filibustering at an oil conference, they won't know what to do. Especially if you're really frail and they're worried about removing you because they think they might hurt you. That's perfect. Like, I mean, I'm looking forward to being that old so that I can do that shit. But <laughs> <laughs> so we can expect more disruption, but actually we're going to give the mic to you now, the audience, because on our Swiss timing here, we've got uh, some time for you to ask any question you would uh, like to our panelists. Um, please put up your hand, and there's a gentleman in blue there who will take the mic, not have it taken away from him. Please give us your Thank name you. and say who you, Jean, you would like to Jean Rousseau, uh, I will answer. speak in French. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the first thing I want to say is just thank the organizers for this uh, uh, evening. It's, uh, we're so lucky in Geneva to have such an important festival. We don't always realize in Geneva how lucky we are to have people like you on stage uh, talking about these issues and having this type of excellent debate. I represent the uh, organization Coordination Climate Social Justice, who will be in Copenhagen, uh, who will be in Paris and was in Copenhagen. And I have a question. Uh, probably a lot of the activists here in the room from human rights backgrounds or um, environmental backgrounds. Um, could also reply to my question. But my question is, uh, in Copenhagen, we realized that the lobbying that we were involved with didn't really change that much. I mean, optimistically, you could say that you maybe changed people's mentalities, but at the end of the day, um, things are getting worse and we didn't actually change anything. And then, you know, out in the street, you can get uh, thousands of people out in the street campaigning, but at the end of the day, it didn't really change anything. So what we decided was here locally in Geneva was to try to show to people that there were local immediate solutions that they could get involved with to combat climate change. And that's the alternative um, movements that you might be aware of. But my question is, lobbying is useful, but it's not enough. And you know, mass demonstrations in the, in the street are good, but they're not enough. 
demonstrating that you can act locally is good as well, but it's not enough. It's so urgent now to combat climate change. So what can we do um, to avoid this business as usual? Thank you very much for your question, yes. If lobbying's not enough, if uh, mobilization and demonstrations are not enough, what is going to make sure that it's not business as usual on climate change? Who would like to answer that question? Jorge? Pfizer. A very short reply on the massive demonstration that was mentioned. I've seen a lot of demonstrations happening um, on several topics but rarely on climate change. I think last year, se in September, the People's Climate March was the big first demonstration against climate change globally that happened. And I think if we can manage to do such a thing in December to this year, it would definitely make a big impression on politicians. So actually, I, st I don't think we exhausted the tool of massive demonstration. Jorge. Si, si je peux me permettre de répondre en français, euh, c'est une très bonne question. Uh, I think that's an excellent question. And uh, there are different levels at which we could reply to that. I think there are two things that are important to distinguish. As we saw in the film, we saw something very important in the film, and that was the effects of Harrogate Sunday. If, uh, you know, a vote is not necessarily rational, uh, but it's on the fact that something is urgent and dis uh, that there is a disaster. This often happens because when there is a disaster, then people react. And politicians often use that and then um, create stronger laws. But we don't want that to happen. We don't want to wait for a disaster to happen before we change the law. So what can we do? to ensure that it isn't business as usual, to create a strong basis politically to change our production of electricity, the way we use transport, the way we create energy. I think mass demonstrations and the process within the UN are important uh, in that we are trying to understand what's happening. But it's difficult to actually mobilize a lot of people by doing that. You, you can only mobilize people by creating an interest, uh, sometimes an economic interest, for change to take place. And I can give you examples of that, uh, why renewable energy industries are becoming stronger and stronger and more and more competitive um, compared to the fossil fuel energies. And this is something we saw in the film. And that is these tar sands in Canada and the issue of uh, oil in the Arctic are becoming problems for business because the um, price of, of, of oil is too low because we're making oil in the United States through these uh, these new uh, uh, these new plans and billions have been invested and now that is having an impact in business. That's a different type of um, environmental disaster, decommissioning this type of uh, uh, activity. But, you know, using economic interest can be an effective tool if virtue just isn't enough. Business as usual. It's never business as usual for the yes men. <laughs> I, um, I don't know. I mean, what, what we're trying to do now is play our part and I think that it's, you know, encouraging everybody to to do whatever they're they're doing well. <laughs> I mean the reason we make funny movies also is we try to appeal to um, young people who like to laugh. You know, we get a lot of high school students and stuff who write to us and say that they got involved in activism or they show up at Occupy Wall Street and say they, they're there because they saw one of our films years ago. And so that's why we keep doing this, and I think that this doesn't answer the question about, like, because the question, I, I, I prefer to, like, really think optimistically about this, <laughs> um, because the, the alternative is basically so depressing. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I, I, but, but the answer, again, is in order to encourage as much, as much disruption 
as possible. We also have this new website called the Action Switchboard, and it's kind of like a, a dating service for people who want to get involved in creative direct action. So um, yeah, everybody can go to actionswitchboard.net and register, and then we can connect you with other people who want to work with you to do something. So that's, I mean, that's what we're trying to do. The last film that we did, um, you know, when we finished it, we felt like we had this great opportunity that in some ways we didn't capitalize on because we toured around with it and there were all these people watching and we thought, well, how can we convert this attention to action in a more immediate way? Uh, people would ask us what to do and we'd say, go join Greenpeace, you know, but that's not what a lot of young people want to hear. They, they're like, no, I want to fucking meet some other people and do something right now. And you say, oh, okay, well, if there's nobody in the room with you now, maybe there's somebody on the internet who you can meet up with, somebody in town, somebody who lives next door that you don't know. So that's the, yeah. Yeah, so there's no one answer, as you've, uh, <laughs> as, as you've heard. It's a number of uh, tactics to uh, effect I mean, change. Yeah, but I, I think that, like, this, this is, it's all these individual stories of what everybody is doing, you know? I mean, the... Uh, what Faiza did in the Ar in the Arctic with Greenpeace was hugely inspiring and and uh, really got a lot of people uh, thinking about what was wrong <laughs> with um, with oil in the Arctic and so I, these all of these different actions are I have to work in concert mm. everything all the time. If I might uh, be able to take a, a couple of other questions, I. Um there's a lady at the back, I think, with glasses. Oh, no, well, I was trying to get a bit of gender parity here. Uh, I'm with a gentleman here with glasses. Okay, please. Um, merci, merci beaucoup de pour cette, uh, Thank you very much uh, for this evening. It's um, been a wonderful opportunity because this is uh, such a vital year for the climate. I'm with the Coordination Climat Social Justice here in Geneva as well. And we're very pessimistic, actually. I think those of us who are following these uh, negotiations very carefully, and we've just had a preparatory meeting here in Geneva, and we saw uh, that it was an absolute disaster. And uh, I think there's very little chance uh, of uh, reaching a, a groundbreaking uh, agreement, or even a, a reasonable agreement um, in Paris. But what is important is that this year is a year for civil society, and that means everybody, not just the NGOs who are always involved, but everybody to get involved. That's the only way that uh, we'll reach something in Paris. You would like to ask the panel? Very briefly. We work for this Alternativa uh, project, and Geneva is one of the uh, 60 towns who's going to put at least 10,000 people in the streets for a weekend with concrete alternatives to propose. Uh, and I think this idea of disruption um, uh, I think is a very good idea. It's very important. And that's why with Mike Bonanno and Monday, there'll be a meeting in the Maison des Associations where we're going to talk about how we can create this type of yes lab, how we can um, learn from his methods um, to um, do funny uh, things in Geneva. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> do you, if I can, uh, there was a lady at the back with glasses. I don't know whether you still have a question. Yes. Mike, uh, good evening. Um, thank you for this bravery, this arrogance that you have. Uh, I agree with a lot of things that you said, but I don't really understand this, uh, your fight for wind turbines. Uh, uh, I know that the situation is depressing and the alternative is terrible, but I wonder if you've heard about the actions in Crete and elsewhere, people fighting against wind turbines being set up. And I wonder, isn't that being cynical as well? Well, I mean, it depends on how the wind farms are set up. You know, because right now they're multinational corporations that are installing wind farms that are displacing people 
You know, and I'm not talking about the not in my backyard, I don't like a windmill on my land type of people, like because I own this land. I'm talking about, for instance, indigenous people in Oaxaca who are being displaced because it's a new wave of colonialism. They've already been pushed to the windiest place or the sunniest place, the driest place, and you know, settled there 150, 200, 300 years ago. And now they're being displaced again because the corporations are saying, we can develop this energy. You know, so this is, there, 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 there are ways of doing it right and ways of doing it wrong. And I suspect that if we are allowed to actually own these resources collectively, the wind and the sun, which is not the plans that are on the table in most cases here, and it's a big problem with a lot of the European frameworks for how wind is being developed and how solar is being developed, particularly in places like Africa, where utility scale projects are being you know, hatched. And so this is, but if it's done right and people own it, my, I suspect that there's going to be a lot less resistance to it. Now, that's not to say that there aren't environmental problems with all these energy sources. Every way that we can extract energy causes a, a repercussion somewhere else. Um, but until we have, but you know, it, let's be realistic about it too. We, we use energy, we like it. I like to take a hot shower at least, you know, once every month. Um, and that, yeah, I know you have to sit right next to me. And that, that kind of thing is just not gonna be, not gonna happen if we don't like, I mean, seriously, like we can either, <laughs> We, we, have to, we have to create some energy somehow, and there's like lots of ways to make things more efficient and save, but also I just think that there's smart ways of doing it. So in the end here, we're not just saying in this final action, let's do wind farms. We're saying let's redistribute power literally to the people. Let's take the power out of the hands of corporations, uh, eliminate the use of fossil fuels, and instead, create socially just energy systems that could potentially solve a lot of the social problems that we've got as well. Thank you. So, there. Um, um, yes, there's a gentleman with a red scarf on. It's very useful to wear something that uh, I could pick out in this dark room. Very quick question for Mike, actually. And you spoke about this on a couple of occasions already, including tonight. But uh, maybe three things, concrete tips that people can take home with them tonight of how to take the struggle further in a yes men type of way. If you could share some insight or lessons learned or <laughs> what have you. Well, three concrete ways. Oh, this is, uh, maybe you guys can help. What's that? Five or ten. You know, actually on our website, the yeslab.org, we have a whole series of tips, and there's been a, a, a ton of recent um, publications. That there's, a public, there's a book called Small Acts of Resistance that's really fantastic, that has examples mostly of, of people who are working under very repressive regimes who, are, who fight back using there's these small symbolic actions that eventually amount to, you know, uh, toppling governments <laughs> when combined with other things. Um, there's another book called Beautiful Trouble, and you can go to that beautifultrouble.org, and there's tons of examples on there of people all over the world doing really interesting, um, provocative things, some of which are incredibly simple. Um, there's another thing called Actipedia that's kind of like a Wikipedia for activism, and uh, the thing about, act about these actions, these symbolic actions, is you don't actually need to think up anything new. You just need to copy something that worked before. Um, <laughs> so that's one of the secrets. It's not like you know, making a, a, a unique, modern piece of art. It's something where you just take something that works, reinvent it for your context, and, you know, and, and let it rip. So, uh, I mean, one of the easiest things, one of the easiest exercises might be to go and um, like look up a local conference, just any kind of conference, right, in your area. They're, they happen all the time. Geneva is full of these things. Mm -hmm. Their security is always terrible. I mean, everybody wants you to think that security is, you know, infallible, but it's, it's, always, it's always completely flawed. Um, if you dress up in a suit, chances are and look respectable. And I say go in there and stand up at the microphone and make an announcement. You know, and, and just look at the context. And everybody can do this. It's really fun. It's it's a good exercise, and it's cathartic. And it's it's a bit like wait, um, 
it's, it's a step beyond ecotourism because you don't have to live, leave home. It's like a, an adventure, but it's an adventure in your own backyard. And you get the rush of adrenaline, like you know, skydiving, but you, none of the risks. It's, uh, and nobody, yeah, so it's, it's anyway, and, and have a friend videotape it and post it online. Um, <laughs> Okay, that's, yeah, that's my advice. Geneva's going to get a whole lot more interesting. <laughs> Too bad I didn't think of that before boarding the Arctic Sunrise. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the other thing is, yeah, go, go board the Arctic Sunrise. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's lots of other actions. I, I guess just communicate with some other people in the room and, uh, and figure out what, what's happening locally and join in. Can I add something to that that is maybe or not necessarily funny? Um, I think if people, if people are, are wondering what can I do this year, I mean 2015 is the climate year, the weekend before uh, Paris, the weekend, I think it's 28, 29 November, don't pin me on the exact date, but the weekend before it starts, that's going to be, I think, a big momentum. Civil society organizations are already talking behind the scenes and trying to pick a momentum that people can you know, make a statement. I think no matter where you are, if there's a city, a village in the neighborhood that people gather, or if you have the resources and the time to go to Paris, just do it. Just do it. It's just standing outside. Probably if there are thousands of people involved, you won't even end up in prison. <laughs> Thank you. One last question from the lady uh, with the long blonde hair. Always helps to stay in the front. I'll take the last question and then we'll wrap up so that we hit seven minutes past 11. But of course, our speakers will be here for you to ask all of the questions that uh, you weren't able to ask now. Thank you very much for the whole presentation. Um, Mike, I just wanted to ask, you just mentioned the fact that we should be taking power away from the corporations and we should be giving individuals agency with their power production. I'm curious to know if you have any comments on Google's investment of $300 million into Solar City to rent people out solar panels, so homeowners in the US. It's recently in the past few days, they've put $300 million worth of investment so that people can rent solar panels, which work out it's cheaper than buying money off the grid, often from coal power plants. Do you think that's a positive step forward? You know, I, I, I don't know. It sounds like you know a lot more than me about it. So I, uh, but it, it, I mean, it sounds like it's a little weird that it's coming from Google. Um, <laughs> you know, why, why can't we rent these uh, as part of like, you, you know, there's medical care, there's things that the state takes care of. Why can't we rent them from the state, um, you know, or own them ourselves? This is the, I, I think this is the, the, the question, you know, I mean, uh, I, sus I suspect that Google has a way of making money off it. It's not just, you know, humanitarian. <laughs> so uh, uh, my, my, my answer is that uh, there's, if Google's making a profit, then we should own that profit too. We, there's a way to do this collectively. If it's a collective resource, it's crazy to think that right now we're like divvying up the sun and the wind and, and handing it over, handing the keys <laughs> to that stuff over to a corporation. It's just nuts. In the, in the Netherlands, for example, and I think this is also the case in a lot of other countries already, you can buy your own piece of windmill, which might be a possibility for people that cannot have solar panels on our roof. So, And then instead of, because I would say with renting, there would be an interest for profit for Google anyway. At least if I would be running a company, I wouldn't be renting out stuff without making money. So I think there are ways with small investments, you can, you can contribute to that transition. Before wrapping up then, perhaps I might ask each of our panelists just uh, to give uh, a final message or most probably in the case of uh, Mike and Pfizer, a call to action. Um, Jorge, final thoughts. Difficult to wrap up on that, on that point. I, mean, I, I, I just have the impression that there one of the main problems that environmental discourse has felt, has faced, is a lot of sermonizing, like it's not getting across. It's like a very pessimistic view. I mean, we're all going to die, this, this and that. And I think, it, again, what, what, I, what, what we started with, the humor part, I think it's extremely powerful. So we, we should really keep that sort of light note when we think about what to do about the environment. Pfizer. I'll just repeat what I said before. Um, the weekend before the Paris uh, climate meeting, just go out on the streets. It's 
It's not a big effort. I think just do it to make that statement, and then we'll, we'll, we'll make it to the end of the century, I hope. Mike. Um, where do people go to join up with, with you guys? What, what's that? In the cap, no, is there a, a, is there a, a, a URL for, yeah, is there somewhere people can go and sign up to get notification? Okay. Maison des Associations. Maison des Associations. <laughs> okay, there's, yes. there, yeah, the that's, gentleman has a that's all I have details. to say is there's literature available. Okay, <laughs> so it looks as if in Geneva we're going to have a fun uh, few months in 2015. Thank you ever so much, everybody, for staying on behind, and thank you very much for our speakers.